Hi there. Can we talk about Disco Elysium? attention to the world of video game, you might have sort of heard about Disco Elysium back in 2019 as a story-driven RPG that was apparently very good. And it might have really gotten your attention when it won Best Narrative, Best Independent Game, Best Role-Playing Game, and Fresh Indie Game at the 2019 Video Game Awards, and the creators just got up and thanked Marx and Engels. And Marx and Engels for providing us the political education. Thank you. And for an award show, which is basically a three-hour-long commercial for Fortnite, and the highlight is watching a bunch of classically trained musicians play the Mario Kart theme, this stood out. The Video Game Awards are an ode to the hyper-commercialized, capitalist, and often corrupt world of video games, steeped in controversy over years of sexual harassment, sudden mass layoffs with no severance, and inhumane and often debilitating crunch culture. And these people are up here thanking Marx and Engels? Look at my man Reggie shoving him off the stage like he feels a bout of diarrhea oncoming. I'll admit, it took me a while to finally play Disco Elysium. My MacBook chugs along like an old-timey choo-choo train of the 1800s, so I had to wait until the final cut made its way to the fashionably late Nintendo Switch party. Disco Elysium is very good, but also very unique in the type of narrative you'd normally expect to find from a video game. Even political ones. This has led to a lot of very smart people making a lot of very smart videos on Disco Elysium, and for a while I was a little stumped. I love Disco Elysium, but what could I bring to the table? Top inspired RPG. So I made a big list of things to talk about the game that stuck out to me, and I went through what I felt I would feel confident talking about. And I realized I kind of wanted to talk about the game's portrayal of mental illness, which I know a lot about. This is not to say I'm doing some sort of thing where I go through and try to tell you that our hero Harry Dubois is on the autism spectrum. He does not like trains enough to be one of us but more about what the game has to say about mental illness and the self-destruction it causes and how to be happy in a world that is absurd at best and utterly broken at worst. Disco Elysium talks about and portrays mental illness in a way I have not really seen video games do in a long time. In a way that is honest and empathetic, but also not at all saccharine or patronizing. And it also fascinates me about how many of the game's philosophies and themes are baked into this in a way I have not seen video games do in a very long time. Speaking of baked, Disco Elysium's world is rich and layered, my dudes, like a cake. So we need to break some eggs here and make this tasty, tasty cake and go deep into Disco Elysium's conception, philosophy, and themes before we can address the core thesis of this video. But I wish to think, that much like wine, you will appreciate the beauty of this video's fermentation and the final creation that it begets. As me saying, I'm going to talk about a lot of shit here. Disco Elysium's premise starts off as a simple detective mystery, but even at the game's opening, things are slightly unconventional. There is nothing, only warm primordial blackness. The first scene is a conversation between the reptile brain, the limbic system, and well, the game does not immediately tell you. Our protagonist wakes up after what appears to have been a drug and alcohol-fueled bender with complete amnesia, to the point where he doesn't even recognize his own face. Unlike other RPGs where you can just make all the other characters call you dummy thick mal for the rest of the game, despite the traditional tubla rasa opening, you do have an actual name that you spend a lot of the early parts of the game trying to figure out. Spoilers, your name is Harrier, or Harry Dubois. Harrier, that's long for Harry. So you are a hurry. As you can see, a lot of this game is figuring out who you are, but also like figuring out who you are, man. Before his meltdown of all meltdowns, Harry had been sent by his precinct to investigate a murder. But thanks to said meltdown, it has now been a week and the victim of said murder is still hanging in the tree outside the inn you're staying at. Lieutenant Kim Kitsuragi has also been sent by his own precinct to assist you in the investigation. And the loud engine of his motor carriage is literally what pulls you out of your subconscious and into reality. Kim brings you into this world, into the present. Note I say motor carriage, like one of those old timey cars you wind up with a crank or whatever. See, Disco Elysium does not take place in our world 
which can be a little hard to catch on to at first as the game is not ever explicitly clear with its lore. As an amnesiac, Harry has to actively ask around and you learn alongside with him. Disco Elysium's setting is not exactly fantasy. The characters have technology such as cameras and lorries. Hi, um, I didn't know this meant like truck until like um two years ago, but it's not science fiction either. Personal computers don't exist and phones are all still landlines. It's also not alternative history. A very detailed history of the world of Elysium and the city this game takes place in, Revishal, was mapped out by the game's creator, Robert Krivitz, and has a 6,000 year history. Krivitz describes the setting as fantasy realist, and given the odd and fantastical nature of the game and its world building, but still grounded in reality, is pretty much akin to magical realism. Go watch my video on Mandy, um, I talk about magical realism a bit more there. This is pretty fitting, as along with being heavily influenced by detective shows such as The Wire and True Detective and Soviet science fiction such as Roadside Picnic, Kurvitz and the other writers were influenced by China Miebel, a far left author who's best known for writing weird fiction, which is just speculative fiction, but weirder. And his works include The City in the City, which is about a murder mystery in a deeply unconventional city, and the Bass Log series, which takes place in a deeply complex and dark world filled with existential dread. Now, fictional influences are good, but I find the most fascinating thing about Disco Elysium is how heavily it was influenced by real historical events. Revishal 49 years ago was the center of a communist revolution that successfully overthrew a powerful monarchy only to have the commune another six years later be overthrown by the coalition of nations an allegiance of moralist nations the game's version of neoliberalism <laughs> the district harry and kim are investigating the murder in martinez was a hot spot for both the original revolution and was shelled indiscriminately by the coalition and is now steeped in poverty mental illness and drug use disco elysium studio zaum is based in estonia a small country on the Baltic Sea that since the 20th century was occupied by the Russian Empire, occupied by the Germans, occupied by the USSR, occupied by the Nazis, and occupied by the USSR again until the collapse of the Soviet Union and officially declared its independence in 1991. Like many other now former Soviet countries, shock therapy was quickly brought in. An economic practice which withdraws the state subsidies, opens up the free trade, and privatizes previously publicly owned assets. As Naomi Klein talks about in the Shock Doctrine, um, this is bad actually. The shock therapy in post-Soviet countries was a complete disaster. In 1994, Estonia's life expectancy had drastically plummeted. Studies decades later showed that the sudden privatization and rapid elimination of social safety nets in former Soviet countries had led to around 1 million deaths. As Naomi Klein in Shock Doctrine says, In the absence of major famine, plague, or battle, never have so many lost so much in so short a time. By 1998, more than 80% of Russian farms had gone bankrupt, and roughly 70,000 state factories had closed, creating an epidemic of unemployment. In 1989, before shock therapy, 2 million people in the Russian Federation were living in poverty on less than $4 a day. By the time the shock therapists had administered their bitter medicine in the mid-90s, 74 million Russians were living below the poverty line, according to the World Bank. That means that Russia's economic reforms can claim credit for the impoverishment of 72 million people in only eight years. By 1996, 25% of Russians, almost 37 million people, lived in poverty, described as desperate. During the Cold War, widespread alcoholism was always seen in the West as evidence that life under communism was so dismal that Russians needed large quantities of vodka to get through the day. Under capitalism, however, Russians drink more than twice as much alcohol as they used to, and they are reaching for harder painkillers as well. Russia's drug czar, Alexander Mikhailov, says that the number of users went up 900% from 1994 to 2004 to more than 4 million people, many of them heroin addicts. Estonia, decades later, has become the wealthiest of the 15 former Soviet republics and is a member of both the EU and NATO. In terms of actual important stuff like human welfare, it's currently ranked number 15 in the World Press Freedom Index, ranks respectively on the Human Development Index at 0.882, and 95% of its population is covered by the country's social health insurance. On a more critical side, Estonia has the largest gender pay gap in all of Europe, and still experiences a considerable gap between the richest and the poorest, the top 20% earning six times as much as the bottom 20%. 
21.7% live below the poverty line. The centrist Estonian Reform Party has played a highly influential role in Estonian's government coalition, especially in regards to the free market since its founding back in 1994. But hey, it's currently the 40th happiest nation in the world, jumping up from the 55th back in 2019. Yeah! So as you can see, given a lot of this very traumatic post-Soviet history that occurred during the youth of the Zaun team, this game might be a little... <laughs> Despite what angry dorks and what big video game companies who don't want to turn anyone away from giving them their precious money, money, money might tell you, video games have always been political. Because not all the time, but usually when people write a story, they want to say something. Maybe they just want to talk about an experience, an idea, a commentary on society. And not all, but a lot of video games have a story. And as video games grow in terms of their storytelling, these stories are going to become more complex. Final Fantasy VII is about the evils of corporations that are destroying the planet. Metal Gear Solid is about the inherited trauma of war and the damage that the privatization of militaries can do. Yakuza Like a Dragon is about class inequality. Fallout New Vegas offers you multiple political factions of different viewpoints and ideologies, all of them analogies to modern day ideologies, and lets you decide which one should be in charge of the Mojave Desert. Disco Elysium, as we will touch on, goes far deeper than most of these games, but to get mad at politics and video game is silly. You might not realize it, but our brain is full of these little thoughts that are like cabinets, and they kind of shape our actions and ideas about the world. You, you see where I'm going with this. So, along with investigating this murder mystery with Kim, Harry and his hungover piss pants self go through the world just full of ideologies. Disco Elysium says, okay, so remember how in Fallout New Vegas the NCR is originally defamed as the good side, but the more you look into them, the more you see their desires to replicate the glory days of the United States clearly shows the same problems of the United States? We're gonna crank this up to 20. Much like how in Fallout New Vegas you're introduced to factions, Disco Elysium introduces you to two major groups who are at odds. The first is the Dock Workers Union, led by the delightfully manipulative Everett Clare, who have decided to go on strike. The second is the Wild Pines, one of the richest corporations in the world who have sent the delightfully bougie Joyce Messier as their ambassador. Joyce has also been accompanied by a group of mercenaries to break up the strike, one who you learn is the man who has been murdered and has been hanging outside the inn for a week, and whose death might send Martinez into an all-out war. Both Everett and Joyce are amazing characters, as they are absolutely ruthless and conniving, but have personalities that make them disarming and make it easy for Harry to become swayed or manipulated by. Everett Clare's union is the one that has been able to offer protections and social safety nets that the impoverished Martinez desperately needs. But every conversation you have with him leaves a further impression of him as the petite bourgeoisie, a little tyrant, especially when he tries to get you to help him evict a group of impoverished people from their homes in a dilapidated fishing village. Joyce is the opposite where she is pleasant and gives you monies. She is also cultural and educated and will talk to you about the world of Elysium, like a world-building girl boss. But she is also representing a huge corporation that has brought along with it the weird fiction version of the Pinkertons to break up the strike. Talking to Joyce is especially great because her education allows time to learn about the four ideologies that inhabit this world. Communism, fascism, ultra-liberalism, and moralism. The game's version of being a neoliberal centrist. So along of choosing how you want Harry to be of his skills, is he a thoughtful thinker, a loud brute? You're also allowed to give Harry an ideology. Which made me laugh so hard at the end when Kim just brings up that it's really weird for Harry to be a cop and a communist. He wants to liquidate the ruling class, which, again, for a police officer, is a little odd. I should also mention that this game has no actual combat in it. Much like a tabletop RPG run by a DM suffering from the generational trauma that was the collapse of the Soviet Union and the sudden inflammation of shock therapy, all actions are passed by a series of checks. While a Harry Dubois who's high on physical points has a good chance of taking someone down, a Harry Dubois high on intelligence or rhetoric or empathy might have a good chance of getting what he needs, be it information, money, or some drugs. The fact that you can fail checks also means you can suffer a huge amount of cringe that comes from watching Harry just utterly fuck up. <laughs> He does. The further into Disco Elysium you get, the further you realize whoever Harry was, he was not a good person. 
he might have been a good cop. Kim comments that 216 cases and only three kills is impressive, but it's clear he was not a good person. He is self-pitying, has poor impulse control, is lecherous, even misogynistic if you take that route. He's constantly apologizing but has difficulty in actually taking actions to make amends or take steps to better himself. He keeps trying to manipulate the elderly into giving him money. As a now amnesiastic Harry, the game gives you multiple options to actually do better than who you were in the past. Along with attempting to solve the murder, Harry also has other side quests. He can help a bunch of kids get a nightclub open, talk a mentally ill woman down from waving a gun around. Oh, Okay, it's actually Harry's gun. Uh, turns out in the middle of that bender, Harry managed to lose his badge, motor car, and gun. Yeah. And help a cryptozoologist find the phasmid, a giant stick insect. One of my favorite moments in the game is when Harry and Kim find a different body. A man got drunk, fell, and fatally hit his head. The quest is pretty simple. You find a library card on the man, find his family, and notify them of his death. It's a sad little moment and also a little ironic because while I was playing this game for the first time, Inland Empire, the weird skill, kept telling me to bother this poor lady at the bookstore about her husband. I stopped because the spirits of this game have a reputation for being super unreliable. But when I went to his house, oh hey, it's, it's that poor lady I was harassing. Hi, um, your husband's dead. The whole scene reminded me of the Medium article, Confessions of a Former Bastard Cop. During my tenure in law enforcement, I protected women from domestic abusers and comforted families who lost children to car accidents and other tragedies. I helped connect struggling people in my community with local resources for food, shelter, and counseling. I de-escalated situations that could have turned violent and talked a lot of people down from making the biggest mistake of their lives. The question is this. Did I need a gun and sweeping police powers to help the average person on the average night? The answer is no. When I was doing my best work as a cop, I was doing mediocre work as a therapist or a social worker. Disco Elysium is a game about a cop, but it's not super interested in telling a copaganda story. The people you talk to distrust the police and barely put up with you. Multiple times you're called a pig to your face. It absolutely rules. Disco Elysium is more interested in using the detective role as a way to solve a mystery. Take a look at the society you have woken up into and gain access into places and talk to people using the power of authority that only a police officer can have. As the game tells you, people put up with your shit a lot more when you're a cop. Anyway. I'm six pages into the script, and we have fermented long enough in this background to finally talk about Kim Kitsuragi. Kim Kitsuragi is everything Harry Dubois is not. He is composed, controlled, no-nonsense, and reserved. Kim is also a person of color in this world, a man of sealite ancestry. The casual racism and microaggressions he is up against clashing against Harry's privilege as a white man. Kim is also the straight man to Harry's tomfoolery and nunfuckery begrudgingly putting up with Harry's drinking, vandalism, and quests to track down a cryptid that clearly does not exist. One of your earliest interactions with Kim is when Harry, hungover and amnesiastic and who may or may not have just assaulted a literal child, becomes sick at the now decomposing and rank corpse of the body outside. Harry apologizes. By the way, um, along with ideologies and skill points, you can also have a copo type. Uh, most people playing this game end up with sorry cop. I wonder why. And Kim says, You need to get your shit together. I can't speak for everyone playing this game, but here I was as Harry, playing a cop and clearly someone utterly wretched and self-loathing, and clearly was someone who sucked. And Kim, this poor guy who did not ask for this at all, was supportive of me and wanted me to better myself. How could I say no to Kim Kitsuragi? In theory, Kim could have fucked off at any given time, but he sticks with you to the point where sometimes you're not even sure why. This made an impact on me so profoundly for the rest of the game, I made it a point to never let Kim down. Save scumming for Kim. <laughs> and it wasn't just me either. Pretty much everyone who's played Disco Elysium fell in love with Kim Kitsuragi and moved heaven and earth to make sure they didn't disappoint our 45-year-old little meow meow. <laughs> Finding that bullet inside the supposedly hanged man that gains Kim's respect and meeting up with him that night to review the case was so rewarding. Unlike other games where you can just hit a dialogue tree until the character tells you every personal detail about their life, Kim is incredibly aloof. Certain file cabinets can tell you little details about him. Aces High lets you learn that he wanted to join the Air Brigade in his youth. Homosexual Underground lets you learn that Kim himself is gay. You are just obsessing about other people's sexuality now. But am I? 
I'll spare you another 20 hour mine project. Yes, I am. Now let's get back to work. I honestly really like this little detail. While improving, queer representation in video games is still lacking, so to have a queer person of color in your game is pretty cool. But most of Kim is guarded, outside of small moments where it's relevant that he brings it up, and I find this interesting. See, pretty much every character you meet in this game is stuck in the past. Renee and Gaston, with Renee's glory days as a former soldier and the men's rivalry over their former love interest and what appears to be a failed polycule. The cryptozoologists attempt to track down a cryptid despite it clearly wrecking havoc on his body and putting a strain on his marriage. Classier using alcohol, drugs, and sex to escape the fact that the corporate espionage she did led to someone's death. Suna attempting to find a 2mm hole in the world to prove that the data lost from the game she was working on was no one's fault, the deserter full of resentment and rage at the failed communist revolution, and of course, Harry Dubois. While Harry's backstory is still vague, we learn that his spouse left him six years ago. This caused him to spiral into rage, addiction, and depression, isolating everyone else in his life. We don't have a reliable narrator, but she cut all contact with Harry and moved far, far away. Whatever happened was messy. And Harry was never able to move on. What happened to him was simply too painful for him to process. Sometimes in the very literal sense. If you find an old letter she wrote Harry before a certain point in the game, you can literally die. So everyone in this game is still living in the past. Everyone except Kim Kitsuragi. We're going to pause a second here uh, while I bring up something. Dialectics. It's Hegelian dialectics, not personal animosity. No, 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 not that one. Specifically, I'm talking about dialectical behavioral therapy. What is dialectics? Well, the philosophy is... The kind you might encounter if you took time to read some books. A lot of stuff. Dialectical behavioral therapy is a type of therapy originally designed to treat borderline personality disorder, but has also been used to treat PTSD, ADHD, and other mood disorders. It's also been proven successful at treating suicidal and other self-destructive behaviors. Dialectical behavioral therapy operates on a number of assumptions, the big one being the word dialectics itself. While dialectics in the philosophical sense is when two people hold different viewpoints about something, the said viewpoints carefully considered and discussed until reason is found, dialectics in therapy is more straightforward and is founded on the idea that two opposing ideas can exist at the same time. This concept can be extremely helpful when you're dealing with people who can only think of things in black and white and in absolute Roots, lines of thinking that enable hopelessness and other self-destructive behaviors. There's a big emphasis when you're in dialectical therapy that you don't say but. In between saying two things as but invalidates the first sentence, you're encouraged instead to use and. I'll give you an example. Harry Dubois is doing his best and he needs to do better. Harry wants to improve and he needs to try harder and be more motivated to change. Harry Dubois might not have caused all his own problems and he has to solve them anyway. One of the big factors in dialectical behavioral therapy include mindfulness and radical acceptance. While well, mindfulness is now something toted out as part of neoliberal wellness and the whole capitalist idea that your mood is entirely on you and how you manage it, true mindfulness is about focusing on the moment. A friend of mine who's a licensed therapist said the best example of mindfulness they've ever seen is Rengoku and Demon Slayer eating his bento. Each bite is delicious, as if he's never had a bite of food before. Kim is someone living in the present. He is not naive, but he is not jaded either. Every school of thought and government has failed in the city but I love it nonetheless. This is radical acceptance. To understand the present you live in is the one you have, and there is a lot said about the importance of the steps you can take mentally with how you get through the day. As I said earlier, Kim and his motor carriage literally bring you into the present. I've heard a lot of discussion about why out of all the political alignments, Kim is a filthy, filthy moralist. And I've heard it's to show like deep down, you know, all people can be good, man. But Discoalism's narrative clearly has no love for morality. Listen to the game's summary of moralism because it's kind of perfect. Moralists don't really have beliefs. Sometimes they stumble on one, like on a child's toy left on the carpet. The toy must be put away immediately and the child reprimanded. 
Centrism isn't change, not even incremental change. It is control over yourself and the world. Exercise it. Look up at the sky, at the dark shapes of the coalition airships hanging there. Ask yourself, is there something sinister in moralism? And then answer, no. God is in his heaven. Everything is normal on earth. I think the reason Kim is written to be a moralist is because, as flawed as ideology is, it's the one most neutral, the most in the moment, if you would. Kim's stability, in turn, becomes your stability. He is your rock, and depending on what route you take, there is something very rewarding about getting better as a person, because you have someone in your life as direct, but also as supportive as Kim. The best payoff from this comes at the tribunal where the mercenaries have gathered, determined one way or another to seek retribution for the death of their fellow mercenary. You're thrown into a fantastic score, frantic skill checks, and some of the best voice acting in the game from a game that already had some of the best voice acting come out of a game in a while. While the main outcome, there will always be a shootout and people will die, is always the same, the way the scene is written is so tight and intense it creates the illusion that maybe, just maybe, there will be something you can say to make the mercenaries back down. Telltale games could never and then the shootout happens. A uh, side note, I've mentioned a few times that despite the moral ambiguity of Joyce and Everard, there are still characters who are endearing and interesting to talk to, and you can apply your big old dialectic workbook at them and see that your opinion and their opinion can exist at the same time. Um, I'm an oddly sensitive person who will do my best in video games to avoid upsetting anyone, except the bookstore lady. I warned you, you're unleashing forces beyond your understanding. Take that, you small business tyrant. But then there's Raoul Courtenay, one of the mercenaries first introduced as a scab worker trying to break up the strike. You can ask him a bit about the history of the mercenaries, and he tells you a story so horrific and upsetting about what him and his fellow mercenaries did, I actually don't want to share it. And goddamn, it feels so good to pass a skill check and shoot him in the fucking face. Oh, um, you can also set him on fire too. Yeah! But in the shootout, you are shot, and as Kim rushes to your side, you see another mercenary about to shoot him. If your authority check is high enough, you can warn Kim. And you will get two bonuses if Kim truly trusts you. This part broke me. Like, my soul had already left my body with the lieutenant gives you a smile and only you can see part, but this was the end of me. And even as Harry is trying to do better, help people, be decent, and not be a total piece of garbage, he is still a very flawed, very broken person. Hell, my Harry still drank on the job. It was just for the power boost. I break windows with my crowbar better when I'm drunk, Kim. Kim knows this. He has been at your side for almost a week at this point. He has seen you counsel a grieving woman, help set up a nightclub. He has also seen you kick a mailbox and take bribes. And despite all your flaws, how much you need to improve yourself, Kim still trusts you. Um, it should be mentioned that if you're an absolute monster and have utterly fucked up your relationship with Kim, he is wounded and out of commission for the rest of the game, leaving you to be paired up with ginger, drug-addicted child rapscallion Kuno. Kuno doesn't fucking care! A fate you deserve for letting down Kim Kitsuragi. But you'd never do that now, would you? Disco Elysium has a lot to say about philosophy, self-improvement, the police. It also has a lot to say about different theories of philosophy. Now, I am very bad at philosophy, but one of the philosophizings I have really enjoyed and I think is fitting for this game is Albert Camus' The Myth of Sisyphus. In Greek mythology, Sisyphus was punished by the gods and was forced to roll a rock up a hill, only to have it roll back down for all eternity. Wow, that sounds pretty absurd. In the myth of Sisyphus, Albert Camus uses this myth to talk about absurdism, that maybe the world is just really weird and really fucked up, and maybe there actually isn't a, a point or a bigger plan. He says you could lie down and rot, or commit yourself to a higher power, live a pious life in hopes of reward in the afterlife, but he says the best option would be to embrace the absurdity of the world. Camus says he's interested in what's going through Sisyphus's head every time he has to go back down that mountain to get the boulder. He says Sisyphus, to avoid an eternity of misery and torment, must know how stupid and futile this task is, but he must accept it. Radical acceptance, if you would. He is content. And Camus says, 
we must imagine Sisyphus happy. The final act in this game has Harry confronting two hinted at but finally seen characters. One is the deserter, a soldier from the communist coalition whose murder of the mercenary was brought on by misogyny, bitterness, and not being able to move forward from his trauma. The other is the once thought to be non-existent phasmid, a giant stick insect who exists and processes information very different from humans. She talks to Harry and is blown away by how sad and miserable he is, but also impressed that he continues to exist and on some level has the capacity to find acceptance and contentment in his absurd and sad situation. We must imagine Harry Dubois happy. Absurdism is fitting for Disco Elysium because Disco Elysium isn't really about fixing the world. The game has this whole part where you subscribe to communism and you're like, oh yeah, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna change the world. And then not only does communism give you damage when you think about things too much, it also leads you to be really depressed. Not point not 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 percent of communism has been built. Evil child murdering billionaires still rule the world with a shit eating grin. All he has managed to do is make himself sad. At the communist book club you join, Harry asks his fellow communist students if communism keeps failing, what's the point? And similar to Camus, they say despite the struggles, despite no tangible awards, they simply can't give up. And they focus instead on small moments of beauty, such as when the elaborate matchstick castle they attempt to make holds for a brief and wonderful few seconds. This is not a game where you save the world or kill God. This is a game where you look at what it means to be mentally ill, addicted, or traumatized, and also see that steps can be taken to improve these things maybe even be happy again despite the sad world you inhabit. Singing karaoke, meeting fellow communists, dancing in the club, getting Kim to dance in the club. These are all wonderful events that reinforce that notion of mindfulness, that there are moments worthy of living in. I see a lot of people watch shows with pretty similar themes and say like, oh my god at me, or yo I cried, or this character gets me, I'm, I'm this character. And I kind of wonder if media can influence people to get better. I don't think everyone who plays Disco Elysium is going to run out and get involved in their local DSA chapter or buy a DBT handbook, but Disco Elysium not being afraid to be so direct with not just its politicalness, but also its themes of self-loathing, self-destructive tendencies, and how to cope with the absurdness of it all is rare and beautiful to see in a game. Will this game inspire the sadder and more self-destructive of us to seek help? I'm, I'm not sure. As I've learned of my own history and self-loathing, and also what Harry Dubois knows far too well, sometimes it's easier to be sad. And that's not to say, oh, just don't be sad, but in that getting better takes work. The game at the end is ambiguous as to what happens to Harry Dubois. Does he go to therapy and get sober? Or does he fall back into old self-destructive habits? The narrative of the game, with the Phasmid telling Harry she's amazed he continues to exist despite everything, and telling him to move on, suggests that maybe Harry is ready. Cause as much as the setting and ideas might tell you otherwise, this is a hopeful game. I want to believe Harry can get better, even if society might not be able to. Disco Elysium is a truly beautiful game, and I hope it inspires other people to make games of their own, where you play as a drunk, mentally ill communist. That's all for today. Thanks for letting me talk about Disco Elysium. Hi folks, thanks for watching. This was by far my most ambitious video yet, so I really hope you all enjoyed it. Leave a comment below if you did, and subscribe to my future videos if you have not already. This video would not have been possible to make without the help of my wonderful patrons, including Big Spender, Kurt Schiller, who requested I say <clears throat> a cab, except for RPG Cops. If you'd like to become a big spender, get your name in the credits, see cute animal pictures, and get early access to my videos, come on over to my Patreon where as little as $2 a month gets you a ton of fun things. You can also make a one-time donation to support me by buying me a coffee, link below. Also, if you are coming to Holiday Matsuri Friday, December 17th, 2021, I will be running my Animals in Anime panel. Come bring your vaccinated ass out to say hi, I'm gonna have prizes. 
I'll be back with a new video in the future. So once again, thank you so much for watching this. It means the world. Take care, y'all.